that the hardest thing about doing anything is starting. Uh, and I think that resonates with so many things about starting a business. We already talked about how a lot of entrepreneurs just do it. Um, and that's definitely a trait, but I, that mantra goes through my head even just day to day. If there's something on my to-do list that I just don't want to do, Pat's voice comes in my head and I'm like, you're right, Pat. I just gotta start and once I'm in it, I'll be enjoying it. Scratch Entrepreneur, true stories of remarkable people who dropped everything to turn an idea into a healthy, profitable business. Every business starts with a problem, something to be solved. Sometimes it's a big problem that everyone has. Like that restaurant you stopped by for lunch the other day, you know the one. It started calling your name around 11.30 and you ran out of the office at 10 till noon. It sang to your belly like the siren seducing Odysseus. That restaurant solves the same problem as thousands of others, hunger. But the more specific your solution is, the better people understand your brand. There's a steak restaurant here in Bloomington, and it always baffles me why so many people spend so much money on dinner there. You walk in this weird side door of a nondescript building. Inside is one huge, loud room. Tables are jammed together with picnic table-style red and white checkered tablecloths. The service is always so-so, but the steak? Oh, the steak. No matter what cut you get, porterhouse or filet, sirloin or T-bone, it's the best you've ever had. The environment? It's the worst, but if you want the best steak in town, everyone knows where to go. The owners of that steakhouse understand that they solve a very specific food problem, where to find the best steak in town. The best business owners know that a clear solution for that specific problem is the foundation of a great brand and can even drive you right through a ton of inadequacies to a successful business. Our guest today has created super smart solutions to specific problems that have plagued beekeepers for centuries. Her and the B Corp team are taking on some of the key issues around a dying community of animals that we actually need really badly. Ellie Sims is ready to share the whole story, but as always, let's start from the beginning. We're glad you joined us. So looking back with kind of 2020 hindsight, what's a story from your childhood that made you write for, for what you're doing right now and what you're up to? Well, I definitely didn't think I was an entrepreneur uh, when I started this. And looking back, I was prepping for a talk one day and I realized that I remembered a dog walking business I had when I was six. So I was, um, I guess, a six-year-old entrepreneur. I uh, didn't have a dog, begged my parents for a dog, but you know, mom does not like puppies. So <laughs> my way of getting a dog was to have a dog walking business. So I made these flyers, I posted them all over the neighborhood. Um, nobody, I guess, wanted a six-year-old dog walker, even if it was a dollar a walk. <laughs> oh, I guess I guess I understand six-year-old, maybe like eight, but you were, I'm motivated and that makes sense, right? It's, it's shown me that even in this business uh, has been a lot of, well, I want this to happen and so we're gonna just go do it. Um, and so it just showed me that, yeah, I definitely was a doer as a little kid. And even yeah. if it was a terrible not success, it, you know, it showed some umph. Cool. So when you just go do it, and I hear that a lot with entrepreneurs, that part of it is you just have to go and do. Do you find that a lot of the times you're more likely to make mistakes in that process? Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, but you don't learn if you don't make mistakes. Yeah. So we don't strive for perfection in anything we do. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's doing what you do and then seeing, I think the key to it is seeing how it worked and didn't work and being able to track that, whether it's a technology thing or a gut thing or a whatever, being able to say, okay, this is the part of that that worked and this is the part of that that failed. Let's focus on the part that worked and adjust the part that failed, right? Exactly. We do a lot of debriefs and that's exactly how you, you solve that. Yeah. So as far as B Corp, for someone who's never heard of B Corp, can you, can you focus in on maybe a story of how the software that you all have created has helped a beekeeper? Yeah, so we do uh, analytics software for beekeepers. 
Uh, our first product actually can tell when a queen dies in the hive. Hmm. Uh, and our, actually our very first customer found out about it the day we launched. Um, and when we put the instruments in his hive, uh, he actually ended up being the first alert we sent out. So huh. it was, I think, two or three days later, I was on the stage pitching at INX3, so I got to share the story of us helping this beekeeper, but he had one of his hives went queenless huh. the first week we launched this product. So that was amazing to help him. Cool that it ended up wrapping up that he was our first beekeeper. Um, and they, these are guys that work full time, this particular guy. So he was able to get out there, take a little bit of time off work and fix his hive. So it was pretty cool how it all wrapped up and I was able to announce it at our pitch competition. And yeah, it was, uh, it was amazing. That hive is, you know, now surging its way through winter. So, huh. so for someone who doesn't know, I mean, what, what's the value of the queen in the hive? Yes, she's the most important insect in the hive. So she's mm -hmm. laying all the eggs, she's growing all your numbers. So when your queen dies, your population is dropping off pretty drastically. Huh. Uh, when that happens, they're, they actually shift their focus from foraging for honey uh, to covering some of the quote unquote household duties I in see. the hive. Yeah. So your honey production's going down and if you don't notice that problem right away, you're gonna go to your hive and it's gonna be, there's gonna be no bees there. So, so how would someone without technology know that a queen had died? Well, so you have to visually notice it. So you'd only visually notice it if it was a big enough issue. Mm -hmm. uh, beekeepers, on average, visit their hive once every two weeks. You don't really want to go any more often than that. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to you have to see it. Um, and unfortunately, even when you notice it's an issue, you've already probably lost a third, a fourth of your mm -hmm. of your bees versus our system. And so you, you don't necessarily want to mess with the hive any more than you have to. You probably don't want to mess with the hive at all unless you're harvesting or something like that. Um, and with the technology that you guys create, you don't have to mess with the hive because it's just ingrained in the system. Exactly. Exactly. It's one less thing you need to check for. Um, and yeah, you can then spread out your visits. You, not, you can now check maybe once a month huh. uh, for a couple different things. and leave the bees alone. So that makes a ton of sense and I'm sure you've like changed a lot of beekeepers experience I would imagine. Is that what you've seen from the folks who have started to work with you? Yeah, yeah and a lot of the uh, beekeepers we work with just love the technology piece. Um, they have the vision with us on where this could go. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think they're quite enjoying it. The alerts are very exciting and they're actually giving us a ton of information. So mm -hmm. our customers we love them because they really want to grow with our company and and see this technology take off. So, huh? Okay, so the the technology seems obvious why it's valuable. I mean, it really helps someone to see inside of a hive when you really don't want to go in there unless you have to. It can show you uh, what's happening inside of that space, and it sounds like a bunch of different ways. So then, like, how did you come up with the idea, and where did that come from? So when we started the business, uh, I really just said beekeeping tech. We're going to do that. Uh, I had read an academic article where they use sensors to look at information about the beehive. Mm -hmm. I know not a lot of people are just pouring through academic articles, but <laughs> I, I know I'm not like a lot of people. Uh -huh. um, and I thought that would be really cool to use in a practical sense and not just in a research sense. So. We spent several months figuring out what was the right model, um, what hardware worked in beehives, and what was the algorithm that was related to queens, and from there just figured it out, narrowed our scope from beekeeping tech to queen monitoring and um, some of the other things huh. we're doing. So the focus on bees, was it just because you saw a problem there that was solvable and that light bulb went off, or do you have some kind of history in the bee world that was the connection there? Yeah, so I. Uh, I, yeah, I've been beekeeping for about six years. Okay. Uh, when I was a freshman at IU, I wanted to build my resume, which again, I realize is a little weird. Most freshmen are focused on other things. So I Googled environmental volunteering, saw a beekeeper needed help, and fell in love. Mm. I came back to campus after that and thought other students might enjoy learning to beekeep. Um, colony collapse disorder was just starting to be talked about. Um, 
and I got a grant from IU uh, to start a beekeeping program. So I've actually been teaching people beekeeping for quite a few years now. Uh, that program ended up growing in attention and grew to a club. So it was an IU club, and then we presented that success to the IU Foundation. And three of those board members pulled me aside and said, we love what you've done with the club, we love you, and we want to help you as long as it's bees. So that's where that next step of bee tech mm -hmm. kind of came. Wow, that's super cool. Yeah, Okay. Thanks. So when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about bees, specifically kind of the politics of bees, the way the world is changing for bees, and, and focus in on that a little bit. Does that sound good? Yeah, great. Okay, cool. All right, so we're back with Ellie Sims, uh, CEO of B Corp. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks. So let's talk a little bit about bees. I mean, I think it's pretty well known that the population of honeybees has been affected by a lot of different stuff and is essentially in decline. You used the term colony collapse a, a little bit ago. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you see being kind of inside the industry? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, colonies are definitely declining. Um, colony collapse disorder is one problem of many problems that are ways honeybees could die. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a third of the population we had in 1960 mm -hmm. um, and I do think our country and our environment could support the amount of bees we used to have then. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, a, it's a ton of factors, right? Uh, it's the climate, uh, the forage they're able to access. Uh, some of it is, is pesticides. Uh, beekeepers themselves mm -hmm. uh, don't use a lot of, I mean, we're obviously focused on technology, but even record keeping. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, a, and then globalization is the other big one, the mites that have been brought in uh, from Europe. Mm -hmm. So I think with all of these things, obviously a lot of these things are huge issues. Right. You know, we're not getting rid of a changing climate. We're not getting rid of monoculture. Mm -hmm. uh, so our focus was how do we just help beekeepers diagnose problems? Mm -hmm. How do we make it easier for them to tell if the hive is struggling? That way they could focus on those hives, save themselves time, um, which is the one thing that's actually going to help beekeepers mm -hmm. expand is really labor and the time they're spending in the bees. So your technology may not necessarily say, well, we have a, a mite problem here, but it could say we have a problem here. Mm -hmm. We're seeing, a, you know, inside Hive 34, we have a declination of, of quality or amount of bees, and we need to check that out. Is that basically how it works? Exactly, yeah. yeah. We do the queen monitoring. Um, <laughs> It's kind of our first health thing, but yeah, mm -hmm. we're working on uh, being able to classify hives based on strength, so that'll be done this year, and then yeah, pest and disease detection. Hmm. So maybe we can't say yet, here, this is a varroa mite in this hive, but we could say, these hives have a defense signal, yeah. um, and we're starting to see that, and you need to go figure you need out. You go diagnose it. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So d dealing with all those pieces are certainly part of how you're trying to help the community of bees, instead of decline, maybe stabilize or actually grow. There's another side of the work that you all do, and it's sort of brought to light by a news story that's out there right now, which is a bunch of teenage kids going out and knocking over hives in Iowa or something like that, mm -hmm. and creating real problems for beekeepers. You're addressing that in some ways. Can you talk a little bit about how you guys are addressing that? Yeah, so we had a GPS sensor in our hives and an accelerometer for research. And we found out from beekeepers that hive theft and vandalism is one of their main problems. So people like come and, and just steal a hive, like take it? Yeah, yeah, beekeepers are stealing hives from each other. Huh. When you're dealing with vandalism, I, that's mm -hmm. probably more teenagers and mm -hmm. or people getting in car accidents, I don't mm. know, bees are often on the side mm. of roads, but right. uh, yeah, uh, it's a big issue. There's, I think it's two million since 2016 hmm. dollars worth of hives have been stolen. Huh. And so how does your software help? So we have an accelerometer, so that hive, uh, we actually can tell when it's being moved, and that's all automated, so that sends an alert to the beekeeper. 
then the GPS kicks in so they can actually track where it's going. Mm -hmm. So that helps for hive theft, but we just recently were out in California at a trade show and had beekeepers who like these Iowa beekeepers um, in Arizona have been just struggling with vandalism. And they found in the past, you know, this is obviously always happening in the middle of the night, if they get out there soon enough mm -hmm. and put the boxes back together, the bees are typically okay mm -hmm. uh, and don't leave. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're really interested in this because that accelerometer would know when the hive's knocked over and they could wake up and get out there and fix it. So we've, we've found a couple different solutions so far with just putting a GPS sensor in a beehive. Huh. So not only if someone were to steal a hive, you could know kind of where it went and chase after them and deal with that situation, yeah. but also if a hive gets knocked over, to be able to pick it back up, to fix it, before the bees have really adjusted and taken off and gone somewhere else, could keep that hive healthy and active. Exactly, exactly. We found out from sheriff's officers who have dealt with theft cases, there was, it was very difficult to prove that the hives on the thieves' property were the original owners. There was right. no way to prove that. So they looked at our data trail uh, that we were offering and they said, this is exactly what mm -hmm. we would need to prosecute a case. Yeah. So beekeepers wouldn't have to just go out and steal them back. <laughs> they could do it legally and <laughs> right. not use shotguns. Right, because if you yeah. don't, right, once, <laughs> once something isn't seen as yours, then now you're stealing it even if you're sure it was yours. Exactly. I had that with my neighbor and our bikes all the time. Really? Yeah, but it's a whole different conversation. <laughs> Um, so, okay, so any other, you know, when we're talking the politics of bees and how bees are changing and the world of beekeeping is changing, are there any other stories or pieces you think are important to share about how the bee world is working right now? Yeah, I'm, I'm really interested to, to watch this industry go into the 21st century. Uh, I mean, it was already happening before we came onto this base. I, I talked about those researchers that were using technology. There's commercial beekeepers that are building themselves apps. I am very excited to see where this industry can go using IoT technology and software. Because mm -hmm. uh, we've already seen that be incredible in the agriculture space. Uh, so that's, that's what I'm really interested in. You're, you have a, obviously you have a new generation of merging in this industry that's pushing it, but a lot of established beekeepers we have found are interested in this. So mm -hmm. I am just, very excited for the conversation to shift between why are the bees dying or, or are the bees still struggling to wow look how much this industry has turned around awesome mm -hmm. okay cool so when we come back we're going to dig into just business ownership we're going to shift a little bit from bees and beekeeping to owning a business and the experience you've had um, since you started b corp so we'll come right back in a second All right, so we're back with Ellie Sims from B Corp. She's the CEO, the brains behind. I'm sure there's lots of other brains as a part of your business yes, too. Yes, there is. Yeah. Um, but so let's dig in a little bit to just being a business owner. Tell us a little bit about maybe a gut check story from the evolution of B Corp. One of those times where it was just like, all right, is this happening and how am I going to walk through it? Yeah, I mean, so I think a startup's biggest struggle is running out of money. And that was probably the first time in our business that I saw it not just succeeding, I saw the potential for it to just collapse. Mm -hmm. um, that was the first time I really saw it going both ways. We were raising money, we had raised a good amount, but we weren't there yet. Um, and typically when you raise money, you've gotta raise the full amount you say you're gonna raise. Otherwise it's seen as a failure. Um, well, this is in like the traditional tech startup style of pitching and getting investors in that whole process is what you're talking about, right? Exactly, okay. exactly. Mm -hmm. And we were so close to running out of money. Um, I was getting very stressed out and then it just fell together perfectly. Um, one of our founders, landlord, um, is an investor in companies and I went to my founders and said, guys, we got to really just dig deep now. We got to figure out who's out there that we could talk to. And he reached out to her, forgetting that they had had a conversation a few months ago and she was interested. And she was, she closed it all up and wrapped it up in a bow. 
Meanwhile, we ended up miscalculating the number we had, so we were still short oh, no. of our full number. Uh, but we ended up having one of our board members um, had somebody that was on the fence and said, well, if I'm the last one in, I'll come in and finish out the round. And that was incredible. We were getting ready to finish, and then I had one of our um, early investors from the best competition, Scott Dorsey, called me, and he said, hey, my business partner talked to you about your company. How did I miss, miss this? And so him and his business partner came in as individuals, and uh, we ended up raising more than we needed. So that was obviously stressful because we were going to have to shut down the company, but it all came together at the last minute. And it's amazing how the timing of funding has worked out in our company. We've gotten very lucky, but that's definitely what I see as the luck piece in our business. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the scariest, the gut check moment and the triumphant moment when it came around. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So when it when it comes to tech startups, it seems like there's all this energy associated with raising money, right? You've got to go out, you got to pitch your idea, and all this money came in for you all. How does the feeling of business ownership change when now you've got the money and now you've got to do the thing? Or were you always doing the thing the whole time or was there a real shift once you got funded? Yeah, so we got really lucky. Uh, we were just working on a business plan and entered it into the best competition a couple months after we had started. And we ended up winning that. And it definitely shifts your mindset because now you're not just self-funding and bootstrapping and the only person you're responsible to is yourself and maybe a couple mentors and advisors. You are dealing with other people's hard-earned money. Mm -hmm. And I take that extremely seriously. It's, it puts a fire under you. Uh, it happened when we won the best competition. I went full time. We got extremely serious about the company. Um, we launched a product. We, we figured it out. And then when we just did this last raise, it happened again, right? You, you don't have to worry about funding. You have this fire under you. And yet, you know how much money you're holding in your hand that is other people's money that they expect to get back plus some. Mm -hmm. And so I like it because I'm somebody who is motivated by outside factors. So it's actually motivated me more than I think it would have been if we were self-funded, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is there any point, I know all tech companies are different, but is there any point in, as you look at the evolution of the business, where investors are paid off and the money is just really insular inside of B Corp in your example, or are most tech companies really looking at, we'll always have investors, it's just a matter of how many and how much and that kind of thing? Um, yeah, so there's there's a series of rounds, right? And we, we think we might even have to do another round. Um, but no, you want to get to a point where either, yeah, your company um, is bankable and you could do a loan and you can actually pay back the investors mm -hmm. um, and give them a return. Some companies do that uh, and then some companies actually exit. Mm -hmm. So uh, through a strategic partnership, they have a larger corporation actually purchase the company mm -hmm. and then all the equity gets liquidated mm -hmm. and they get their money back plus their return. Mm -hmm. So that that is when you accept money from mm -hmm. an investor, your end goal is to make that investor money. So it mm -hmm. definitely, it changes how you think about a business. Mm -hmm. You're not, you don't have the luxury to grow slowly and grow organically. Okay. Yeah. Tell me about a moment that taught you some important lesson about business ownership. We focused on money, so maybe something yeah. that doesn't, you know, is, yeah. is less about money. Like, what's, what's an important moment that, that taught you something about business ownership? Yeah, I think the hardest thing we dealt with in our first few months was just figuring out what to do and what to spend our time on and how we were going to accomplish large goals. Mm -hmm. We ended up, I mean, we started with an old Gantt chart and that didn't work for us. Uh, we, we actually use a Hoshin matrix. We ended up figuring that out. But while I was talking through that with one of my mentors, uh, Pat East, he's the CEO of Hannapin Marketing, he said to me, and this might have been told to him at a previous time, uh, that the hardest thing about doing anything is starting. Uh, and I think that resonates with so many things about starting a business. We already talked about how a lot of entrepreneurs just do it, mm. um, and that's definitely a trait, but I, that mantra goes through my head 
even just day to day, if there's something on my to-do list that I just don't want to do, Pat's voice comes in my head and I'm like, you're right, Pat. I just got to start. And once I'm in it, I'll be enjoying it. Mm -hmm. So um, I love that piece because you've got to find something that's going to motivate you because there's nobody, you know, you're, you don't have a boss. You don't have you don't have a teacher. There's nobody knocking on your door making sure you checked off all your boxes mm -hmm. for the day. Yeah. Okay. What's one thing that you love about owning a business? Yeah, I love how much I've learned. Um, I did not study business in my education. So I love the knowledge I've been able to get and how I've seen that business can do well. Mm -hmm. So that's one piece for me. And then also just to have control over not just what we're doing, but how we do the work yeah. is pretty special. And I realize now that not a lot of people have that luxury to, to set a company culture mm -hmm. and to make a company as flexible as they want it to be. I love that. And I realize that is a ex blessing of running your own business. Totally agree with that. Mm -hmm. So what's one part of owning a business that you just can't stand? Oh, geez. Um, probably all the sales calls you get. Uh, I mean, my phone number is on our website. Please don't call me. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I should have said that. I, uh, uh, we're switching numbers. No, I, um, I, and I get it and it's sad because we have to do it for our company too, but it, it drives you crazy. Yeah. And you, you, I respect, I respect salespeople so much. Um, and so I'm always pretty respectful and let them know that it were a startup and things like that. But yeah, your phone's like you're you're not yeah. your own email or phone anymore. You've yeah. Yeah, and I think that you know when it comes to those sales calls, like there are some that I I like. Yeah. And most that I don't. Mm -hmm. And I think the difference tends to be folks who call and say, "I want to hear about who you are as a business. I want to know what you're up to, and maybe I can tell you a little bit about how I could help you out." Yeah. And you know, if it doesn't make any sense, then totally cool. Exactly. You know, and I think that a lot of those folks are in specialized areas. So maybe they're in uh, digital marketing, or maybe they're in SEO, or maybe they're in you know making my life easier as far as my CRM or whatever. You know, and if they listen to what I have to talk about, then suddenly I'm like, ooh, I've got somebody. Yeah, they're a salesperson, and I know that they're cold calling me, but I also have an opportunity to ask some questions of someone who's an expert in that field that I may not have had the opportunity to ask before. And so in those scenarios, I tend to ask them questions, even glean information that I can use myself. Mm. And in the end, I got something out of that call and they got to establish a little bit of that relationship with me, which was the purpose of the phone call in the first place. Yeah. Um, so I think folks that are coming in just wanting to learn mm -hmm. instead of the, the ones that call and just wanna tell yeah. To me, that's the difference in the sales calls, but it's also, you know, you're getting inter interrupted, especially when it comes to the phone calls, and, and, and so I agree with you on that one. Yeah. I like that approach you have, though. Let's see if I you think, can. <laughs> I think that uh, would help me, and yeah, yeah, I, I think that obviously the worst part is being interrupted, and for yeah. me, it could always be a customer calling, yeah. right? So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So obviously, you do a lot of visioning as a part of your business as to where things are going. You're adding elements to your software, you're adding pieces to your app, you're listening to your customers and, and adding those kinds of things. When you look down the road three or four years, where do you see B Corp? Yeah, so we actually have that Hoshin matrix. It starts with your three to five year plans. Uh, and I won't nerd out about a Hoshin matrix right now, but it, they are templates online and they're awesome. Um, one of them is we want to be an employer that employees love to work at. Mm -hmm. We want to be a company that is attracting people and that people love to be at. Um, the second one uh, is we want to keep hives in an innovative way uh, and do research in a good way. Um, the third one is we want to have technical solutions out there for beekeepers to better manage their hive. So that's kind of the product, big product goal. Fourth is we actually, through those products, want to have a data set that could be used by researchers and institutions to 
actually look at some of these problems of why is this stuff happening? What's causing this? What are some of the regional patterns? I, that's one of my main goals. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, I think I said five, did I say four? I can't remember what the last one was. I, thought, I, think that, I think you're on five, but it could be six. It's five, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're color-coded, and I, I think I said, uh, okay. I think right, I said cool. yellow, green, and red, and blue. <laughs> no, yeah. Red on. Yeah. Okay, so that was, that was the fifth? I think so, Okay, yeah. cool, we got there. Yeah, <laughs> I might have said four. It's awesome. Okay. <laughs>So uh, if folks want to find you, maybe they're a hobby beekeeper, maybe they have hundreds of hives and they've listened to this story and they're just like, wow, I really think this product could help me. Um, how could they reach out and find you? Yeah, well, we uh, have our website, which actually has our contact information or a contact form. Uh, that has been a great way people get in touch with us. Um, we have our Facebook, uh, our LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, and then uh, I already revealed that my the number on the website's mine. Uh, but info at the bcorp.com actually goes to me too. So. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. Good deal. Well, it's been a pleasure sitting with you and just chatting about your business. Really impressed with the work that you've done. Thank you. And the, the, the product that you've created. And um, thank you so much for spending some time with us. No, thank you for having me. This has been a blast. Special thanks to Ellie Sims for taking the time to share the B Corp story with us. If you enjoyed this podcast, there's a couple of things we need you to do right now. First, subscribe to Scratch Entrepreneur on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you can hear future episodes as soon as we release them. While you're there, please give the show a review. It really does help, and we'd love to know what you liked, what you didn't, and what you want to hear next. Editing and production is by me, Jeremy Goodrich. The music is by my high school buddy, Mark Vinton. He totally used to pick me up every morning in a pop-top VW van. He looked like Jim Morrison, and my dirty overalls just might have had a peace sign patch sewn to the leg and an eat more kale button on the strap. Until the next time, we truly appreciate you listening.